Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of An Unexpected Podcast. And today I am joined by my co-hosts, Matt, Evan, and Rob. And we're going to be going over um, some of the new releases that happened during um, the August 7th uh, reveal of all the new miniatures and such. We're also going to be going over the FAQs that happened also in August, August 5th, our fourth, and uh, talking about the impact of those to the game. And then we'll round it off at the end with a little bit of some Articon talk, because that's a big thing coming up. So uh, first off, I guess, Matt, with the reveals, what new models were shown? All right. So I'm going to put this up on the screen and we can all go through it together. But I, I guess before I do so, Devin, congratulations on the new deep voice. It's really great. I really like it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Man. I think it's the mic, actually, because I'm not... <laughs> it's I mean... really you, you, you've developed like the the NPR, uh, um, you know, news anchor. Hello. And today on an unexpected <laughs> podcast. Okay. I'm just I'm just glad that after so long you've finally gone through puberty. So <laughs> yeah. congratulations. A, uh, by the way, I was, <laughs> I was deliberately not going there. Thank you, Evan, for just mm. taking it there. Well, anyway. that's that's the name of the episode, right? <laughs> Devin hits puberty. I yep. saw Evan doing it and I'm like, yeah, I should probably get on that. <laughs> you gotta learn from me. <laughs> uh what's next? A beard. One can yeah. dream. Oh. All right. So okay. All right, so here we go. So, uh, so this is the preview. Um, I think we'll, this preview, I've got this on the screen. We're going to walk through it here. This is all a, um, uh, basically a synopsis of, uh, of an hour long presentation that Adam Troke uh, did on the Warhammer Twitch, Twitch screen that is now available on the Warhammer community. So if you want to hear, uh, Adam Troke talking about this for an hour, rather than us talking about it for 15 minutes or so, um, you can go online and you can uh, hear Adam discuss it in all his glory. So there are, I think there's, I guess. Just, there's uh, like, Matt, if I could yeah. interrupt for a second. On my screen, I see the FAQs, not the, oh, the previous. Okay. Sorry about second. that. I wonder why that is. I think we just uh, maybe hit the back button or something. But maybe, and maybe in a different browser. All right. Well, stop share, reshare. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Technical difficulties. All right. Now what do you see? Oh, right. now I see some now, beautiful Now we previews. see the correct thing. All Ooh. right. It's as beautiful as Devin's puberty. Let's go. All right. And of course, <laughs> being who we are, we're not even going to bother to edit this. So uh, everybody's going <laughs> to everybody's going to going to see us stumbling along as we go. Yeah, this is this is a really polished product that we put out here at an unexpected Welcome podcast. to the unexpected podcast. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. So this is the Middle Earth preview. And I think there were three categories of stuff that got put out. And there may have been four. But let's talk about the. Oh, no, I guess there were four. There's there's one I don't care about that much, but uh, mm -hmm. some new players to the game may. So I guess we should talk about four categories. Mm -hmm. The first is uh, the Battle of Osgiliath uh, box. Actually, Rob, do you want to talk about this? I mean, you're kind of associated with this or... Yeah, sure, I can talk about yeah. that. Um, so what we're looking at now is essentially a brand new starter box for the game to replace the current Battle for Pelennor Fields. Which is, which is a little bit sad because Pelennor Fields was such an amazing starter box um, and probably, I would say, the biggest financial value uh, as far as product put out by the company um, in a very long time, if not ever. And it brought a heck of a lot of people into the game uh, with the new edition. So it'll be somewhat sad to see it go, but it has served faithfully for... Uh, I believe now four years. I can't believe it's been four years since the most current edition has actually been out with us. Um, but this new box, the return to Ascilioth, or I'm sorry, it's called the Battle for Ascilioth, is going to be the new starter box. So um, as you would expect, it's a kind of a mixture of excitement in here, some new miniatures, uh, and also crucially a new rule book that is kind of... Um, well, they were saying it's it's not a full new edition of the game, but it does take all of the various FAQs and erratas, which, if we're being honest by now, is almost as long as the rulebook itself. Um, and they're rolling it back into the rulebook to make it a coherent product that has everything kind of in one place again, uh, along with various reformatting, restructuring. Uh, Adam talked a lot in the 
the stream video about lots of new pictures and just the new layout. And uh, I'm very excited to see what, what that's going to look like. But for our, from the perspective of, you know, the game we're going to be playing, it sounds like it's just going to be the rule book we have now with all of the FAQs and erratas that are relevant <clears throat> rolled into it to kind of create like a streamlined product. Um, they called it like a half edition or something like that in the video, give or take. And, um, and being a starter box, it's likely to be a very good value for a heck of a lot of miniatures. Um, unlike the next thing we're about to talk about after this, I actually think this has a good amount of value both for new players and for old players in the game. Because this actually has uh, several new plastic kits in it that we've never seen before. So it is uh, obviously themed around the Battle of Asgiliath, so it's going to be Gondor versus Mordor. And specifically, what we're really looking at is um, the Rangers of Athelian Legendary Legion fighting Gothmog's um, Gothmog's Legion, Army of Gothmog, whatever that one's yeah. called, Gothmog's Legion, um, in kind of like succinct miniature form. So on the Gondor side, you've actually got a brand new uh, plastic Faramir on foot, along with Damrod and Madrill. So what used to be the old metal um, ranger captains of Gondor or something like that pack that is going away are being replaced in beautiful, shiny new plastic and and they look pretty great, actually. I know, yeah. I know some people have um, had mixed opinions about Faramir's pose or whatnot, but I don't know. I'm looking at that and I'm like, this is this is a phenomenal trio. Now, if I had to, if I had to have any complaint about this at all, it's that Damrod, your 25 point throwaway nothing character, is getting a plastic model before the thousands of other important characters you want to see. But seeing as they're all going to be kind of on the same sprue with Faramir, that's um, that's not so bad because you're kind of getting a three-in-one package. The um, figure that everyone's been screaming for. I, I mean, I'm just still waiting for the uh, plastic hairy goat leaf pack personally. So until <laughs> yeah, then. I think that's actually the one I'm waiting for too. <laughs> yeah. I'm shocked they haven't yeah. released that. You know, I mean, with the bits in this kit though, you could make a pretty convincing hairy goat leaf out of it. So just kit bash it for what everyone really wants. <laughs> well, I, I, I think they're probably, before they put out the plastic hairy goat leaf, they're pr trying to sell more than three of the 500 that they already produced to the original one. So... <laughs> I mean, I can't really talk. I bought him, right? Like, you oh, know, you're you're one of the right? three, eh? so <laughs> yeah. I, uh, me and uh, me and the uh, two other guys I know, we've we've really enjoyed the uh, the Harry Goatleaf Appreciation Society. It's really been taken off. So. <laughs> but in any yeah. case, so you've got the um, you've got the three kind of core uh, heroes that comprise the Rangers of Athelian Legion, um, Madrill and Damrod being kind of the sub lieutenants, and then that pairs with the new. Uh, Forge Old Resin Ranger Captains that they released with, I believe it was Quest of the Ring Bearer, to kind of get a complete rehash of all of the Ranger characters. And they're leading um, 12 men at a, uh, uh, Warriors of Mysterious and 12 Rangers, all old sculpts, nothing super exciting there, but you know, from the perspective of a starter, great, that's what you need. You need some, some models. Wait, 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 is that thing following the bow limit? It is if you're Rangers of Athelion. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Because you have all the Ranger characters, yeah, right? Um, it's just you don't usually see warriors of Minas Tirith in the Rangers of Athelian Legion. Um, yeah, but, but you can take You will, <laughs> but now you will. Um, that'll be. You'll great know who for bought the, the starter um, box at a tournament. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, and then on the evil side, you've got, like I said, it's a, it's essentially the army of Gothmog Legendary Legion, and so you've got a brand new and pretty incredible looking plastic Gothmog. Uh, he comes on his warg and on foot. Uh, I know they mentioned in the stream that he does have some weapon options. I don't know if he's got the shield option in there, but you've got plenty of orcs in that box to I, give him a shield. I must him. butt in here and just like the sheer amount of hair gel they must have used on that <laughs> warg is just like incredible. Like I, I have never seen a mohawk like that in my entire life. Yeah, I mean, it, it actually kind of looks like the, the warg saw something scary and like a cat, all its hair stood up, right? <laughs> So, no, I, I think, but Evan's I think it's right. cool. It's really bulky. It's really intimidating looking. Yeah, I, I think Evan's right though. It, it's like just come from the groomers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Could you fluffy, imagine Gothmog walking the into like a PetSmart to pick up his like freshly quaffed <laughs> ward? Yeah, that's right. Hi, I'm Senor Tumor Face, and I'm here for Fluffy. <laughs> so, I'm actually a little bit surprised by 
the proportion size difference. Does this is this how it looked in the movie? Is this more accurate to the movie? Is that what they were trying to do? Because I, I mean, the movie one was, was pretty was humpy. I don't know if it was this um, freshly quaffed, but it was pretty uh, <laughs> pretty lumpy in the movie. So hey, could you make sure that you do his nails because they're getting kind of long? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. <laughs> Here's See you this time next week. There's a little something extra for you. I know he's trouble. If you need me, I'll be over in the fish section. So, um, and he's leading uh, what looks like like 24 or so Moran and orcs and a uh, Mordor troll. So, uh, a great little start to a Mordor army, uh, specifically if you're going to do Army of Gothmog. And if you already did buy the Pelennor Fields box set, then this is going to just give you a super mega awesome huge mortar army where you've got you know you've got a witch king a gothmog a bunch of moranins some trolls um so if you if you just have pelinor this is uh this is a great way to expand on that mortar army uh and then the last um and probably in some ways the the coolest part of the box is a new modular uh gondor terrain so just like they did the rohan yeah. houses and they did the uh, ruins of Dol Guldur, we finally have a, uh, a fully modular set of ruins to make Gondor tables, whether that be Ascaliath or Minas Tirith or whatever you want. It's also just a fairly generic fantasy looking structure. So, you know, you could use it for pretty much any fantasy game or, you know, any game really. But it really um, helps boost sales for them. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, all, more terrain is always a good thing. Um, and it can be annoying dealing with like 3D printed terrain all the time. And so modular plastic stuff is always high on my agenda uh, of wants. And the fact that you can kind of, from what they said, stack this into big structures or make several little ones, it's it's going to lead to some pretty awesome um, Ascalia style boards that I'm very excited to both build and play on. Um, and then, like I mentioned, there's going to be a new rule book in there. It's a hardback that collates the, the current rules with the um, semi-rewrite that we've had through the erratas, um, plus the usual gubbins for a starter set, dice, measuring, measuring sticks, uh, a scenario and profile book for the contents of the box that let you play the, the, um, the scenarios um, with those two forces. Pretty, pretty standard starter box type stuff. And I would imagine it's going to be significantly cheaper to buy as a package than it would be to buy individually. So chances are that if you want, you know, somewhere between a third and half of the box, let's say you're a collector and you want the new book and just the new plastic characters, that alone will probably have paid for the box. And then everything else will just be a happy extra to use or dispose of or trade or sell or, or what have you. So um, I'm certainly excited about it. I I will be picking one up for sure, if for no other reason than to add that plastic Faramir and that terrain to my collection. I I recently got into playing Gondor, and I sounds um, turns I'm out sorry. I really enjoy Did them. You say so, you recently? Yeah, got I just into I just Gondor? discovered them. Um, turns out this faction has just not been in my life for any amount of time, but that's a mistake. So, so are you using an obscure definition of the word recently that I'm not familiar with? <laughs> He's Wonder. actually just, he's 500 years old, so everything is recent to him. You know, I, um, I just, I met a guy in a bar and he gave me this fancy ring a couple hundred years ago. And, you know, it's just been really great since then. So yeah. I, sometimes I don't see myself in the mirror so well, but I'm sure it's fine. So. <laughs> so, but yeah, so very exciting. The Battle for Iskiliath brand new starter uh, for the game uh, will be replacing the current Pelennor Field starter. So if you... Do not yet have that and want it, and you probably should because it's great. Then go ahead and pick that up now because this will be coming at some point this year to replace it. Um, and yeah, you know, exciting stuff. I actually, uh, one thing I actually did notice with the um, the army composition, I don't know how good we'll ever win. Like, if you have mm -hmm. two new players and this is all they have, and let's just say we want to just play this game out. I mean, Gothmog. Moran and Orcs and a troll versus a hodgepodge of Rangers and Gondorians with three minor heroes. I'm sorry, Farmir is somewhat mediocre hero, I suppose. But it, like, is there anyone thinking that Good is going to win this fight? But well, okay, so Good has bows. Okay, maybe maybe that's what they do. Good they has Good has everything. a lot of bows. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, so if, you, go ahead, Evan. If if your troll rolls like mine, and if Gothmog has a stroke, I think Good does have a fairly reasonable chance of winning. 
Um, but even with the large amount of bows, I think I agree with Devin that if uh, anyone else is playing with the troll and if Gothmog is uh, actually being Gothmog, I think this is a pretty um, decisive uh, win for evil. So, well, I mean, well, you, I mean Evan, I, I'm pretty sure looking at him that Gothmog has had several strokes. So, we yeah. exactly. okay. that's, that's, I wasn't taking it out of the realm of possibility. <laughs> yeah. like, with him, you, you don't really know which Gothmog's going to show up. Let me look at that guy. But, um, and you're also forgetting that, that the um, Gondor side has Damrod, which is a pretty big equalizer, if you ask me. So. Well, I mean, I mean, he got a whole new model. Of course he is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, it's just, and, um, it and because with... even pitting just the infantry versus the infantry, which seemed to be an equal even number, uh, the Moranans will just destroy the other side. I mean, they're getting wounded on sixes by bows, but then they crush on fours and fives in close combat. Yeah. Well, well so... but you have to remember two things. Um, one, I don't think it's meant to be fair. And two, like <laughs> canonically, they lose that fight, right? So yeah. like, I don't think you're supposed to win if you're Gondor. It, I think it's you're life. It's not meant Gondor. to be fair. But it, I mean, it also <laughs> comes with this whole book of, you know, Battle for Asgiliath scenarios and, mm -hmm. and profiles. So uh, yeah. I, I assume you're, I, I mean, it's not like you're going to play everything on one side, everything good in the box versus everything evil in the box, at least yeah. not you yeah. know, necessarily necessarily in a balanced scenario so hopefully they've kind of thought this through a bit um i'm so sure they I, did if if they have scenarios in there which yeah. i didn't miss then then yeah it'll probably be fine you're probably not meant to do any pitch battles yeah yeah i i, I think that if anything it's meant to be like the core start of an army you're never really expected to go battle box on battle box and just crush um or be completely even right i don't think the pelinor fields box set is particularly fair either right i think evil pretty much walks through that as well but but it's you know certainly very thematic and um for those who are interested in this kind of thing it also lines up fairly nicely with what you need for the narrative scenarios in the um gondor at war book so if you get this and you are just starting out you pick up gondor and war with it and you have the core of pretty much all of the gondor based scenarios um ready to go on both evil and good so so I, I have a couple of questions on behalf of the people like me who did not actually watch the interview with adam mm -hmm. um so for the for the rules manual when he says like the faqs have been integrated into the mm -hmm. rules manual is it just the rules manual faqs or are we still going to have to go to the fa well they're now all one thing, but are we still going to have to go like to the errata, to the uh, armies of the Lord of the Rings to figure out how Ballista work? Because those rules only appear in the errata to the um, to the Dwarven uh, 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 Ballista mm -hmm. thing. Or have they actually kind of incorporated it all? The, the rules manual. I, um, I mean, the, the honest answer is we have no idea. And yeah, they okay. weren't for a very specific, right? Got it. It was all hand wavy. Um, yeah. All right. Well, enough. I mean, it's not inconceivable that if they're going to reprint the core rule book, um, you know, kind of updated for the four years of changes that they would also do the same for the profile books. Right. Yeah. Um, I would certainly I would certainly hope that if they were going to redo their profile books, they'd give it more of a look than just what's in the FAQs that rolls yeah. in. I think. It needs yeah. To work I, that, I mean, but my, my question was kind of more specific to the um, well, there, there are certain changes to the profile books that are actually changes to the <laughs> rules. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the one that jumps to mind in my head is the, the change to how the ballista rule, well, or at least the clarification to how the ballista rules work, which if you need to figure out, for example, how the Isengard ballista works, you need to look up the FAQ mm -hmm. for the Dwarven ballista, and that would be something they could have thought through. But I mean, I, I certainly hope that all of that right. stuff is in there, right? That would be, that would that be, would be really... nice. Really right. nice, especially because siege engines have so many FAQs now, right? So, yeah. actually, um, just the fact of like Gandalf's shadow facts with um, Black Dart that you have to know about that FAQ, right? In order to even mm -hmm. like it's like, did they because that FAQ that changes the rules? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think what's going to be what's going to be hilarious is if those things are not in there, but they do still exist because the FAQ is not going anywhere, and so then it's going to be confusing of. Does the new rule book override right. the old FAQs or Fair are they enough, still yeah. relevant? Right. So um, here's hoping that it was looked at comprehensively and it's not going to open, um, you know, more questions than it answers. But, um, you know, at least 
Here's the thing. At least it's not being marketed truly as a new edition, because if they were going to say this is a new edition of the game, I would hope that there would be more to it than just the FAQs. There's more to address. But for a new starter box, kind of a new rule book, um, just for now, it'll do. So, yep. um, so it says that this rule, the new rule book is going to be 224 pages long. Does anybody happen to have one of the old rule books? Yeah, I can hear them. I'm, I'm curious to know if this is longer or the same size. All right. So old rule book including the um the like table of contents and appendices well, and everything is 207 pages so yeah. that is uh what 27 28 new pages in there okay cool so there's there's new material in there that's great yeah. um yeah. and my last question uh is why is madrill's hair purple or- i don't oh, think it's his bleeding hair. they mentioned He's that bleeding it's- in the scene in the movie that this is representing, he got you know hit on the noggin a bit and was bleeding across the uh, face. And he's so. a Vulcan, so he has... Yeah. Oh, no, wait. Vulcans have green... Oh, no, it's the Klingons I, who have the purple blood. Okay. You, you know am, what I actually I think this is specifically meant to represent? You know that scene in the movie where Faramir is like running panic from orcs and rounds the corner and they're like, get the hell down! And then all the rangers fire? I think yep. that's what it's meant to represent, right? Yep. I am enough. pretty impressed that... Um, Whilst they were hiding behind pillars, they still found uh, rocks to stand on uh, in order to look more heroic. Speaking um, of pillars, too, really apparently those to are models. optional. So mm. apparently those can be are removed the rocks? For, um, for logs. And so you can put them on woodland bases as well. So the, huh. so they said on the stream. Probably. I hope that they have elven cloaks and they just always count as obscured by bringing their own terrain. That's, right. that's what I want to see. Oh my God. I really hope they change <laughs> the, like, stuff like that. Because now it's like, could you shoot the pillar? And I know I'm going to get those questions. In Nova, that actually right? is in the FAQ. Somewhere. You won't, Devin, that because they won't be out by Nova. Don't count. worry. Yep. So. Uh, all right. So let's see. And if somebody does ask a judge's ruling on that, I'll be like, just get out. Just get out. <laughs> just, just get out of this door. You're, yeah. you're not welcome here. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So the next reveal they had were uh, battle hosts, mm-hmm. um, which were, uh, I guess, they're new starter boxes for armies. So mm-hmm. you get kind of a named hero and a collection of figures and i think they had they had four of these if i'm remembering correctly yeah, they had four. a wardor battle host right. which comes with uh the witch king and a bunch of his um orcish friends so he's got some war riders and some orcs with him mm-hmm. uh and then we've got the isengard battle host which comes with uh saruman uh grima and of course some urukai and then we have the Minas Tirith battle host, which comes with everybody's favorite, Gandalf the White, uh, along with uh, his friendly hobbit riding along with him that has no rules, um, and uh, some Knights of Minas Tirith and some more Warriors of Minas Tirith, if you want those too. Then there is a Rohan battle host, which comes with Amr and some Riders and some uh, Warriors of Rohan. Um, so, so what's going to make... Go ahead. I think the thing that'll make or break this is the price mm-hmm. like it and, and i honestly have no hope for it because we've seen gw do this before um they've done battle style stuff and it literally is the same price as if you had just bought them all individually uh they so, did confirm that it would not be that it would be cheaper than buying it all individually so so at least there's that i don't know by how much right that's that's the big question you, right you I, said I you agree. can confirm that it is cheaper well, that's what they had said on the stream that they um, said that, that it okay. would be cheaper so it's than the parts okay. individually. Yeah. Then, if that is the case, then as long as it's more than like five dollars, mm-hmm. then it's probably going to be a, a great thing for anyone kind of just starting out and doesn't have these armies. So, yeah. um, just from the perspective of GW, like um, you know, ba- uh, army starter boxes that they've been doing recently. Uh, generally they tend to be somewhere around between 30 to 35 percent off than buying individual units so oh, that's an excellent discount. yeah so if they follow oh, okay. that mold essentially and it looks like all of the boxes are basically the same they have one hero um, box and two boxes of infantry slash cavalry right so you've got for example the witch king with a box of 24 orcs and a box of six war riders um, all four all three of those pieces roughly cost the same so i would imagine that one of them will be free in the box or mostly free, right? So let's say they're what, like 40 bucks a piece, that's 120 bucks individually. And let's say they cost like um, 85, $90, something like that, right? 
Um, that would be my guess. That's nothing that I have like any information on. That's just, you know, having, having worked around starter boxes for other GW games and kind of knowing the way that they, they tend to do these things. That would be my guess. Um, they also did say on the stream that they would be putting out uh, either PDFs online or within the box with um, the profiles. Now I wasn't clear to me whether that would entail any changes. So if I can go into wish list mode for a second, I'm hoping that this is the opportunity they take to make Pippin a writable oh, that uh, would be thing nice. for Gandalf that would be in match good. play. That would be <laughs> awesome. And just give him the extra attack and resistance to magic just like Durnhelm. That would be unlikely. what I want. So um, I would be very shocked if they did that. No, what's going to happen is would... it's going to be there, but it's going to be unofficial, so you can't use it in match play. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. That's what's going to happen. That that would be that would be far more marketing savvy than I would I would give them credit for. But if they did it, you know, you, you would I, I would imagine you would see Gandalf the White, that Gandalf the White uh figure or that battle host box that would probably be like a 50% increase in sales right there. Yeah, they, for sure. For sure. But, but yeah, I mean obviously for veterans, and all they would have to do is a, lot do a there, PDF but... and, and put it out. To, yep. to get that to take that money off of the table but yep. you know i think I'm it's great for new players to have these it's obviously not a lot for um people who are already have large collections but then again even veterans start new armies and it's a it's a cheaper way to get some of the core stuff you need for for the armies so the mordor one is great for angmar for example right more so than mordor i'd even say but i think um lord of the rings is one of the games where gw does the least amount of tinkering of the rules to influence sales Mm-hmm. Um, or at least that I've seen anyway, because I, I, I've noticed that with you know the other games where suddenly things will get better and then you know of course it boosts sales, but in this I mean certain models have sucked for years. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's like in the state. <laughs> this is the way. <laughs> yeah. And then there are some models that have been OP for years, like Damrod. So yeah, hopefully exactly. he'll change in the new box. <laughs> yeah. All right, so. Um... So speaking of models that have been around for for years and getting a um, getting an, a, at least a new repolishing, uh, the next thing that's coming out is a new Glorfindel Lords of the West and Guards of the Gladrum Court. I don't quite know why they lumped these two together, but they did. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I don't know. Either. They're not they're not in the same army list. So in any case, there is a new um, uh, Glorfindel foot and mounted model coming out um, that. Wow, does that look does that look like a fun model? That looks yeah, like a I great think it looks model. fantastic. Holy yeah, cow, right? Fantastic model. And, that is, and not only that, that is for, amazing. For some reason, you get a you get a bonus. Uh, well, they're not showing it here, but um, you get a bonus uh, banner bearer that gets. Oh, we're, we're going to get to that. In. That's in a that's in the that's, different. That's catch. Elrond. Yeah. Oh, that's Elrond. That's okay, Elrond. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, I thought that was Glorfindel. Um, yeah. So anyway, Glorfindel is great. Um, and they remind you that you can, or that Orif, Orifim is coming out, who's going to be another one of those models that no one's going to buy. Um, but uh, except yeah, for the, well, me, except and, for the me and the Harry Goatleaf Society, we're there. Yeah, the Harry Goatleaf Society so. is in. Those same three guys are going to buy it. Um, like, I mean, here's the thing. Like, I am. I am an idiot and I buy all of the Lord of the Rings stuff. So I'm going to pick up that pack. Exactly. Um, that, that's what uh, GW needs. I'm a collector. More, more they, they know, <laughs> they know that Orifin is terrible and that I'll never use him, but I'll pick up the pack. So. Yep. Um, and uh, so Evan and I were noting that um, this, this pose that they've got Glorfindel on foot on is this, this, this basically Eastern, Eastern style thrusting, pose um yeah. that they've uh, that they've they've picked up people who people who are familiar with uh, karate sword forms will recognize i mean that. wouldn't that be practical though in the sense that no. these elven oh so no. the elven blades don't mirror like eastern style swords well well, well maybe they the problem is this the stance is not practical because it provides no coverage for the head this is the this is the practitioner. I mean, speaking. Dad, these are the same guys that uh, created the rules for two-handed weapons. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't yep. uh, give them too much credit here. Yeah, this is um, this is this is by the way a show stance um, that is why it shows up in karate forms. But um, if you you would take a nice crack to the head if you ever tried to use this as a guard. Well, if um, you really think about it, I mean, Glorfindel Glorfindel got owned by a couple Balrogs in the first age. 
And then he never really is described as ever fighting. So maybe that's his whole thing is he just does like a showy pose and yeah. hopes that the enemy runs away, right? Victory by intimidation. That's fair enough. <laughs> that's how we got the fight seven. Okay. Yep. Um, and so we also can't have... lose a fight if you never fight. That's true. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, Azar got the fight seven by being big. So I guess uh, there's always an argument for that. And Bolg well, got to fight seven by um, being. Azog? Also big. <laughs> well, I mean, in in defense in defense of Azog, at least he got the fight seven by killing or defeating a whole bunch of fight six heroes. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, didn't even the Witch King run away from Glorfindel? Like he never actually um, fought him, right? So the Witch King technically ran away from Arnor and uh, Glorfindel and the giant army behind them while he was basically trapped in alone. Glorfindel brought the army. You assume that he fought, but it doesn't actually say he fought, right? I'm and he's sure the one who told posed. Arnur that he shouldn't go after the Witch King because, um, you know, not by the hand of man shall he fall uh, and made the prophecy that, you know, made the Witch King think he, that he is unkillable uh, and never think of the, the loophole for gender, apparently. so I, I am very interested in how the Witch King learned of this prophecy. Was it like word of mouth? Like well, Glorfindel he, told someone. Well, I think he heard like, Glorfindel say it while they were like kind of having a standoff or something. I don't know. Didn't he just hear about it on the internet like the rest of us? Could be. Mordor.net. I, mean, I think that's <laughs> more logical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, or maybe maybe Arnor told him the when he um when he later went to challenge him again and was oh, never seen nice. ever again, right? So maybe he went into Minas Morgul and while he was being, you know, tortured to death, he's like Hey, I heard this cool thing about you once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never, never believe what you hear on the internet or what you hear from torture because they're, you know, <laughs> roughly equivalent in uh, veracity. The internet and torture Part-time are goal. indeed roughly equivalent. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So the other thing that that is also coming out, I see. I, I assume this is not in the same pack. I assume this is a different pack. But uh, yes, I would there, assume. There's going to be a guard of the Glad- new guard of the Gladrum court figures, which are in poses that appear virtually identical to the old guard of the Gladrum court figures. Um, and I guess the big change is you get an interchangeable banner for all of the guards of Gladrum court that you want to give banners to, which is none. Zero. Um, yeah. So looks know, cool they, though. It, yeah, well, I mean they look well, they look cool. I'm kind of scratching my head as to. I mean, I gotta this, say, but comparing these models to the models we already have, I kind of like the older ones better. Um, I, I, I think I just I, like them better. I kind of want to say it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Cause I, I mean, I haven't gotten out. I haven't gotten out my, you know, guard of the Gladrum court to, to look at them and see what poses they're on. But there are, you know, the, the original guard of the Gladrum court figures are fairly static poses with pikes raised and these are three new figures in fairly static poses with pikes raised so i mean um, if if i had to make a theory for why this happened it's a couple things um the old guards of the galathrum court were sculpted at a time um when i don't believe you had the plastic galathrum kits yet and they don't yeah, if wasn't. you look closely they don't actually match so the armor is different uh, on the galathrum court and um it matches the old metal haldir's elves galathrum but it doesn't match the plastic ones couple that with the fact that they can technically take a banner whether you do or not and there was never an option for that so if they were going through and saying oh we should sculpt that banner for the you know um galathrum court guards uh, it probably was more economical to just get rid of the old crappy resin and do a completely new forgeable pack of multiple new Galathrum Which court, they've right? been going That on now about. also match the plastics mm. and the, mm. all the new heroes they've released. So Ramil so, Orphan so, and um, the Helm's Deep Haldir that's swinging the sword. Uh, so, so let me get this straight. Your theory as to the impetus behind these new figures was it was all driven by the need to create the Guard of Galadrum court banner figure that nobody has ever bought. I mean, does well, that sound unreasonable for so, what we know? You know but I mean, actually, <laughs> for what we know, okay, I'll give you that. Yeah, <laughs> I actually think that Rob's right. Um, they, I mean, I think that's the whole point of Glorfindel. Like, I mean, they sculpted those, a plastic is... damrod to justify a Faramir, right? Like, so yeah. who knows? I actually think that that um, Rob's theory is exactly spot on. They've been pretty intent on saying that they do not want to have any profiles mm-hmm. in the book without models and 
you know, they've made their reasonings for that, but they've been going through and like clearing out, you know, getting these, these banner bearers basically. So yeah, I think they just kind of got locked into it. It was in the book. So yeah, they just needed to make it. Um, well, they were already yeah, working but- on Orifin and Rumil Resculpt. <laughs> so maybe they're like, you know what? These are functionally identical in terms of bodies. Why don't we sculpt a few extra arms and, and create a pack of Galathrum Court while we're at but, it, right? But we're still not going to have high elves with shields. <laughs> Why would anyone yeah, want that? Yeah. That's just no one silly. has ever used a high elf with just a shield yeah. in their Come entire on. lives. Come on. No one has Chocula. ever converted the entirely useless just sword models to put shields on their back in order to have high elves with shields. But, this but by all happened. means, let's rush the Galadrim banner bearer out. <laughs> all right. I, I do agree that I actually, um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with these, but I, I personally prefer the the OG ones as well. They just, yeah. Uh, look, there's, uh, there's something, something wrong about with these. I don't know. You know, I'll buy a pack of two or two because mm-hmm. I could probably use some more Guard of the Galadrim Court, but I, you know, I, I mean, it's probably like going to get me in the these, OCD, what, right? What the ad is, yeah. Like, if I'm going to be using the plastics, I'm going to want the ones that match the plastics, because otherwise it'll drive me crazy, so. All right, so now we have the last of the, the releases, Elrond, Master of Rivendell. And again, completing the line, because we have no Elrond figures currently in the line. It's nice for them to finally complete the line and put How him How many out. Elrond figures are there? They are interest. legion. You could probably create an army just from Elrond figures. So they are legion in terms of however, how many have been sculpted. How many are currently available to buy? I have no idea. I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty sure I own like all of them, but yeah, I mean, probably. Do do we have Uh, pajama Elrond? Oh, maybe we don't. No, I think we do have pajama Elrond. No. (laughs) I'm not sure I painted him. I I mean, who would paint that garbage model, but... Um, Pajama Elrond is the master of Rivendell one, right? He's the one that's like standing like this. Oh, yeah. I don't think he's garbage. He's okay. No, he's I, I like him better than, than Metal Last Alliance Elrond, who kind of has a, a horse face to me. But no, I so you guys are coming at it from different perspectives. Rob, you're coming at it from the perspective of what does he look like? And he does kind of look cool. Evan's coming at it from the perspective of why would anyone in his right mind buy Elrond without armor? Oh, and yes. He's completely indeed. right about that. Well, then there's even there's an even worse one, which is the old White Council one that has no sword either. So he's also unarmed on top. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> that one's even that one's takes the cake. At least Master of Following Rivendell has the an footsteps Elven Blade. Of uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. I wonder if they're ever going to make more <laughs> significant downsides for being armored than just like swim tests. So that way, like you could almost justify <laughs> taking yeah. an unarmored person. Yeah, I, I also think that it's gotten to a point where, at least at most events I've ever been to, like things like that don't matter. Like if you were to use that Elrond and say he has armor, no one's going to say different, right? right? So, yeah. Now, actually, I think in GBHL tournaments, you must have the version with the armor. I think they made that like a, a thing for them. Well, I don't, uh, maybe that was in the last that's edition. That's important playing They a had game. different <laughs> profiles in the last edition, right? But I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think that exists anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If anybody tried to call someone on something that ridiculous, I'd be equally inclined to show them the beautiful <laughs> door in the corner. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I would call you out on it. I'd be like, where is his ring? Are you sure he has it? <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, just like how if somebody shows up uh, to the table with old Thranduil, um, they actually just can't use the Thranduil profile entirely. It's nope. not allowed. Yeah. yeah. I know you <laughs> say you've cast Nature's Wrath, but where are the horses? <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, I do have to say, look at this model. The mounted model looks great. The only thing that makes me a little trepidatious about it is that it appears it's got one point of contact. Ooh, um, yeah. So, yeah, that could very well be. Though I would, I would just stick and it'll probably have a peg. So yeah. just glue the front hoof to the floor. That's what I would do. The modern plastic I, is a lot more durable than the old horses were. So hopefully yeah. it's a stronger it's not just um, gonna, limb. Yeah, because that's the last thing you want is your fifty dollar plastic model to be broken. Oh yeah. Yeah, off the bottom. I do I do believe the time for conveniently placed rocks is upon us. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there's it, plenty I mean, to spare from your battle of Asgiliath. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and then the foot model, I don't know what, this is another one where I'm going to have to wait to see the model, but I don't know whether this is a paint job or a sculpting job, but the foot model looks like they took a current IMDB picture of Hugo Weaving and took the, uh, took the face off of that. Cause 
does <laughs> look like he's 70 years old. It does. I mean, he has certainly aged and not well, I might add, for, for an elf. Um, <laughs> yeah. He, Come to think uh, of it, his pose is kind of a perfect mirror for the um, show fighting he does with Glorfindel because they don't actually fight. So yeah. this is just a display. Um, yeah. So, well, I, I mean, I guess, look, as someone who's, you know, advancing in years, I guess I really shouldn't complain that the models are advancing with me. So um, you're getting representation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, right. I, here's the thing. I have to admit, I love everything about this model. I think it's awesome. Um, I think it's very interesting uh, that they chose the Last Alliance version of Elrond versus the modern like Rivendell Knights version, though. Uh, I don't want to read into that because, you know, I would not make everyone look stupid but me. But I do love the idea that this could theoretically lead to something Last Alliance down the road. Um, and it looks really cool. Lots of I don't, cool I don't think they're touching Last Alliance until they see what this show does. Yeah. I, I just, well, I, don't, I honestly, at this point, don't think they're touching the show. I don't think they can get the license um, because, like, it's so convoluted, right? With the whole Amazon and New Line and whatever that I, I imagine, I don't, I don't really think we're going to get show models anymore. But well, that doesn't I, I mean we will get Last Alliance from the movies either, right? I'm not saying that there's necessarily correlation. I will say this. If there's money, there's a way. Um, well, it so, went, well, yes, that's true. There, if there's enough money, people will find a way. Mm -hmm. So we'll now see. I would love new models tied to the show. Um, I, would, I would hope that, they would not just completely stop models from the trilogy because you know we're kind of on a roll getting some really cool stuff well, I'd like that to continue. The only reason but... I say that is because of Venarion. <laughs> they they have actively stopped anything from the last lines. I mean, if any model in this game needs a new resculpt, it's the new Venorians. I mean, literally well, and the old like, high elves, right? Yeah, well, of course the high elves too, but yeah. the new Venorians are much smaller than they actually should be. Well, but yeah. the Hiles and Numenorians are on the literally the same plastic sprue, right? So they both literally need to be. And recut. then there's that too, yeah. So, well, I, you know, look, I can't imagine that given that Amazon paid half a trillion dollars or whatever it did for the rights for this Rings of Power, <laughs> that nobody at Amazon would have thought to roll in the product rights as well. Somebody mm -hmm. thought of that. Uh, I mean, especially at a place like Amazon mm -hmm. that, you know, sell stuff <laughs> um you know whether or not they they shell out enough and more importantly whether or not gw is willing to shell out whatever mm -hmm. um amazon is willing to charge for it um you know i guess that's an open question but i i have to think though if not games workshop who else is going to pay who's going to pay more for those rights than games workshop is yeah and i mean that is I, that I is the question i can't think right? of anyone has bro well, I, I imagine if there's going to be no. competition in the arena, that Games Workshop will probably ultimately want to um, pony yeah. up. Because yeah. if I remember correctly, this was something that came up several years ago now, where the license was going to expire, and even though the game was, you know, functionally dead at the time, this was kind of the dark ages when we were all, you know, keeping the game alive in our basements with no support whatsoever. They still rebought the rights just so that nobody else could have them and could not challenge them in the market, um, as far as I remember. Yeah. So, like, if somebody I mean, else is going to do it, I think Games Workshop probably would be like, okay. Let's talk, right? And, and I don't think anybody else is going to do it because I don't think anybody else other than Games Workshop can monetize those rights mm -hmm. for the amount of money that Games Workshop can, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Hasbro as, a, Hasbro as a joke. I mean, Hasbro could do it. Hasbro probably you know, has the money to throw at it. Um, but Hasbro isn't going to, it doesn't have the infrastructure to recoup that money, yeah. right? Which is why Games mm. Workshop will probably out you know will outbid hasbro is because games workshop can make more money with the rights than hasbro can well and i also think that it's you know no other company that is within the miniatures war game space can put up that kind of money like asmodee could buy the rights you're right hasbro could buy the rights but they don't make miniatures war games really right exactly like they'll, they'll probably buy the rights for board games and that kind of thing right and card games and whatever like that's but what that's they a do. separate that's a separate yeah. license and so yeah. so they'll probably bid in buy licenses to do that but i don't i don't see why they would they would have an incentive to suddenly be like hey we really need to stand up our plastic injection molding so we can create a tabletop war game to challenge <laughs> games workshop right like yeah. it just doesn't seem um reasonable but yeah. 
But the, I mean, the reason it kind of uh, my alarm bells went off just a little bit was because of this other model that is actually on the screen, which is the random high elf banner bearer that is very specifically <laughs> holding the banner of Gilgalad. Um, that is, they talked a lot about how it's the banner of Gilgalad, and it is, if you didn't know, the banner of Gilgalad. And they said Gilgalad as many times as I'm saying Gilgalad right now. Um, and so, you know, Maybe that's, that's literally clue, nothing, then. but it is very interesting mm -hmm. to me that they would choose to go with this version of Elrond if there wasn't at least the option for some plans going ahead, right? Yep. Fair enough. Okay, then that, all right, so I can, if if that was emphasized that much, because I didn't um, see it either, but um, if then, then maybe that's a, that is a sign, so. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. It could literally mean nothing, and either way, it's a really cool model that you can use in whatever age you want because it really doesn't matter. But um, but they did spend an awful lot of time um, emphasizing how it's the Last Alliance version of Elrond, which again might mean nothing. But you know, well, I'm just going to post cool. it on the GBHL as speculation, and it'll turn into fact, and you know, disappointed communities when everything gets revealed. So, well, I mean, but. That's that's just what you do, right? Yeah. Right? And that, just... ladies and gentlemen, is why you don't believe either the internet or torture. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, the banner bearer, while a very, very random, very random inclusion, um, does look really cool. <laughs> that's a really cool yeah, looking no, elf, right? Yeah. <laughs> the only thing missing is a shield. Well, I mean, we don't know. Maybe it's in the kit, right? Maybe it's on the sprue and they just didn't include it. Or maybe elves don't have shields. Haven't you learned by now? Yeah. Well, yeah. I Only mean, have you, ever seen, have you ever seen a banner bearer um, in the box that has a modeling option of putting a shield on them? Because I haven't. Mm. I, I think that's something you usually have to convert onto them. Actually, yes, I have. <clears throat> the, uh, the new Black Dragon banner bearer has a shield. Am I wrong? Oh, um, the that. um, the um, the Lamroth guys as well. The the resin ones yep. have a shield for the horn and the banner, even, and it goes on their back. So it's theoretically possible. So yep. did did GW ever make like a shield sprue? I mean, an like... independent shield sprue. Yeah. Or no, not to my knowledge. Uh, okay. The the metal um, spearmen obviously come with shields, right? But they they're not like. But they never made a shield. I don't know why they don't do that. Well, like because so they would prefer to seed to so many things. Yeah, they, they prefer just to seed that space to all of the license invaders who are out there. Who, yeah. I, well, I think um I think it's a much simpler reason than that. I mean, all the modern kits have come with all the options you need, but these kits were made literally 20 years ago at this point, right? Yeah. I mean, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary, which means that the last alliance kit is 20 years old. And back then, one, the technology wasn't there, and two, it was a narrative game. Nobody, nobody cared, right? Like that that wasn't the thing um and i don't even think they could take shields back then right so, so well i'm saying it's... like right now they could make a sprue like for all the different shield options now maybe that's because they don't do it because it takes up too many um <clears throat> what do they call it the slots that they have the ski slots or i forgot use the is a skew skews yeah so yeah. maybe that's the reason but then maybe put it all in one box sort of like they do the cash yeah. well here's the thing like if they were to do it i think that i think i i think you're absolutely right a forge world like upgrade pack line just like they did for gundabad for other races to include shields and other gubbins that you need would be a great idea oh, why plastic stop is way you too do, expensive though you could do spears bows yeah all of it you could do I mean, they do upgrade packs for all sorts of stuff for all sorts of games. Um, there is no reason um, why they couldn't do it for Lord of the Rings besides, I would imagine, bandwidth, right? I mean, Lord of the Rings is still, or Middle Earth rather, is still a fairly small studio within the monolith of Games Workshop that is dominated by, you know, Warhammer 40k and Age of Sigmar and other games. And so outside of bandwidth, there is nothing preventing them from doing it. But I imagine bandwidth is a real issue. And I imagine also money, right? Because... There's a certain amount of money everyone gets from Games Workshop, and I imagine they all have to bid on their piece of the pot. Um, and if you get a shield sprue, maybe you don't get a character sprue, and characters will, you know, sell more, be more sexy, right? So, well, uh, I, I don't know I, if they if they think that a some of the random characters that they put out are going to sell more than a shield sprue, they have not done their math. Well, um, I, I certainly think that, you know, not to rat on him too much, but something like a hairy goat leaf probably will not outsell a high elf shield sprue. No, right? no. I, I mean, yeah, frankly not. And, you know, I, I got to say, 
probably this new Elrond isn't going to outsell a high elf shield sprue because there's already six Elrons out there. There's already a banner bearer out there. It doesn't add anything <clears throat> to the range. Whereas if you put it and, and and look, there's a there's a way to do this right so that the, the numbers work. I mean, even if it's just like, you know, here's a box of shields. So you get, you know, a box of um, you know, you get like a sprue of uh, high elf shields. You get mm -hmm. a sprue of um, uh, well, Florian shields. You get a sprue of Thranduil's Hall shoots shields. Th there's a way to get this marketing at the right numbers so that you can get enough, you know, so basically so you can make your money and make a significant profit on it. But what it is, it's something that actually adds to the range so that people will buy it as opposed to, just the collectors who are like, well, it's it's yet another Elrond figure, so I'll buy that too. Um, I mean, I, I will say that plastic tends to sell a lot. Uh, a lot of people don't want to deal with metal, and even fewer people want to deal with fine cast resin. So um, I know just, just from today, uh, a ton of people who were not playing Rivendell before who plan to start Rivendell because of the new plastic Elrond. So um right, i don't think well, it, but i don't, I don't think it should about, be an either but... or right i think yeah. that that's the that's the key here is that you can have your plastic elrond and then when those people who excitedly bought him they then need to buy their shields so like you could do both and in fact well, they would be symbiotic and um and probably cross promote sales but that's why i think it's more of a bandwidth issue um yeah than it is uh anything else all right fair enough um so that's i think the last of the releases um the Believe other so the other uh, 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 neat thing that has happened recently is a new set of FAQs. Woo! Or as we are calling them now, Arata. The rules. <laughs> yeah. yeah the rules. Um, here, let me uh, <laughs> um, get those back up. All right. So that was the next. The second thing we were going to talk about was the um, the new FAQs. And let's... Pop these up on the screen. And here we go. Um, new FAQs. Uh, there weren't a lot of kind of huge ones that were in here. There were a lot of cleanup ones. And then there were two or three that actually have some significance. So mm -hmm. I guess let's start off with uh, Army of the Hobbit. By the way, thank you, GW, for combining the FAQs under one button. So you no longer mm -hmm. have to search in two different places to find all the rules changes um and rules changes that are yeah and faqs that are you know really rules changes but masquerading as faqs um all right so the first one here the first one that's new here is can a wood elf sentinels uh eldamar magical rule special rule be used to make an enemy model charge if the model they are charging doesn't have a control zone the answer to that is no i it, think was that ever a question i like, I, what, I think I think if I'm remembering correctly, the rule said you couldn't make somebody enter a control zone. Uh, okay, so it didn't say specifically can't charge. Can't so charge, can't right. It was a terminology you. type thing. Um, uh, the next one, can Bjorn transform himself into bear form if there isn't enough space to place the bear model? If so, what happens? Uh, and the answer here is yes, so long as the only thing that's in the way is a model and not immovable terrain. In this instance, Bjorn will be placed so that the center of the bear's model base is where the man model was previously, then move any displaced models the minimum distance possible so that they are one inch away from Bjorn. In this situation, play, players take it in turn to displace models, starting with Bjorn's controlling player. Bjorn may then move normally. I would point out the way this is written. If Bjorn is standing next to a tree and there is a model like on the other side, he can't change because it says so long as the only things in the way are models mm. and not a movable terrain. Yeah, but then he would have to be like wedged between a tree and another tree or something, nope. right? Where he just, the other he side... just has to have a tree somewhere within his, his base ring. Bare base base. <clears throat> well, um, I don't I don't think that'll be too much of a problem, to be honest. I mean, you most people change when they're in kind of like open air anyway um i actually yeah, think that, that's true uh, I, I think the more interesting well, I, I guess that's my point is like 
while that's theoretically true, it would be a very rare situation to find yourself in it, I guess, right? Unless you're somehow wedged between a tree and the end of the board or nope. something where like you don't have the half inch movement you need to make sure you can clear the tree, right? I think the interesting yeah. application of this though is for like last turn plays or like to push people off of objectives mm -hmm. when the game is about to end. Mm -hmm. I don't know a hundred percent if you can make that work, but that would just be interesting. Cause I've seen a lot of games lost over millimeters on like hold ground or domination. And mm -hmm. if you can just suddenly shrink him and then re-expand near enemy models, you, you actually just move enemy models randomly. The, the other time this would matter is contest of champions when he has to start near the center of the board. And he has the potential to get screwed if the other guy, you know, even if you've got your line of Bjornings in front of him or whatever, um, you know, if, if the other guy can kind of trap him in, in some sort of circumstance there, and he happens to have, you know, something like, I don't know, a well or a statue or a tree that's uh, somewhere within his bear base, he could actually get locked in to the point where he can't change. I mean, I've also seen it ruled before that uh, if he doesn't have uh, a base, a uh, Bayorn base that can fit in there, he cannot transform. So I think this is a good clarification all around. Um, oh, oh, there goes Rob. Um, ah, Rob's gone. That uh, now he can basically transform anywhere, even if he's <laughs> surrounded by a bunch of guys. Um, well, I but only this... but only if he's surrounded by a bunch of yes. guys. Yes. Not yes, by one, like a bunch of guys in one much. tree. Yeah. Exactly. I guess the philosophy is if he transforms uh, in that way, he'd be like a video game where he like spawns in with a tree inside mm -hmm. of him. And I guess that doesn't work. Um, yep. um, but, yeah, uh, because you, you, you're you required to center the bear on the model's base. You can't like, you know, put the put the bear like a little to the left to avoid the tree. Um, but all right. And Rob's so offended by this interpretation that he has left the podcast. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> He's like, screw these guys. <laughs> yeah. You, you argued with him too much on the whole, uh, GW sprue thing. Like he was just done with it. You know, yep. <laughs> Yet another per person that I have offended off of the air. All right. <laughs> um, so the next one can be or use a skin changer special rule when he moves as part of a heroic combat. Yes. Yes, he can. I think that is how you would use like last turn. If you know that you're going to have a last turn and you got to get some people off the objective, you do a hero combat change. No. Well, I guess you would have to already be a man in yes, man you form would. to do that, but you would have to get to it, get to the end of the game with Bjorn still in man form, which if yeah. you can pull off um, my, you which have, why my, would he be in man form at that? You point? have my, uh, my awe and adulation. Yeah. Does yeah. it, <laughs> does it specify that he, can only transform once it does right yeah you can do it i think once actually that's a good question once no he can, he can or change. once per i think he can change to bear and then later on he can change back to man and then later on he can change back to bear and then later but he can't he can't no, do i it mean multiple i mean no, no, no. he means turn. in a single move can you change oh. is it is it per phase or per turn i don't know See, i, I would, I would be the very armies curious. of the hobbit rule book here because what i would what I was thinking was transform into a man, uh, call the heroic combat, then transform back into a bear and just like push models around. Um, but I don't, I assume. Because um, if the I'm wording says, the now. if the wording's like when he moves, he can do this, then maybe you could argue you could do it multiple times in a single move. Yeah. Because if it doesn't say like once per turn or once per phase, then you could do it as much as you want, which would create. Really interesting scenarios, um, but so all it specifies is um, um, at the start of Bayorn's move. Uh, so no, you can't you can't do it more than once. Then, well, wait, um, yeah, because I mean, now they, he can move as just, part of a heroic combat. Yeah, so I think Evan, I think Evan's right. Well, you'd have to do it during the move phase and then again in the combat phase. So Correct. that's how you do it. Yeah. But you couldn't do it like all no, in the you, combat you, phase. You cannot, you cannot like, now I'm just imagining um, in the Legendary Legion where you can do it for free. You like walk down a one inch wide gap with like a yeah, bunch just of models changing. and you just flick in and out <laughs> yeah. and just push them all over. That yeah. would be awesome. But no, you can only do it 
once in the move phase, I think, and then once in the combat phase. Yeah, so, is how I'd rule it. So, so the way to use this this master class tactic uh, is to change. You know, you start out in bear form. You can change into a man. You can get into the type of combat. Uh, call a heroic combat. Um, win the heroic combat, and then move on to the objective. Transform into bear, and then push everybody you off. Transform into the bear first. Uh, you have no. to do it at the start of your move. Oh, all right. So that's that's probably not going to work. Um, because I, I was thinking, yeah, you're well, right. You can you, charge one of the guys and then kill the guy, um, and then just turn into a bear and then push and, them and back. push other people away. Okay. Well, actually, you know what you could do is you could you could like win that heroic combat. You could chart change into the bear and then push other guy like some of your other guys onto the objective. Oh. Yeah, you could, you could like accelerate some guys forward whilst in man form, like run up to them, turn into a bear, and then push them forward. So is Rob, that that useful? Probably not. Yeah. So Rob, just so you know, we we have now spent like ten minutes going down this how does Bjorn transform rabbit hole. Yeah. So <laughs> I see. Sorry, my uh, my power <laughs> randomly went out, so uh, I had to restart my computer here, but um. Nothing changed from when I left. So yeah. So apparently, <laughs> you apparently your anything. power was so bored by this conversation. <laughs> I'm done. I'm out of here. <laughs> like I'm enough. I've had enough of these Bayorn shenanigans. <laughs> Just get All off right. the call already. All right. So um, yeah. So anyway, we we've come up with we spent far too much time talking about the clever interrelations of these two FAQs that you can do and nobody's ever going to actually use. So okay. Uh, which brings us to the next one, which is, can the white warg be chosen as the assassin in the assassination scenario? If so, what happens? Uh, the answer is yes. However, if the white warg is chosen as the assassin, then whilst Azog is still riding him, any kills the model makes will be attributed to Azog and not the white warg. So right. basically, you give away your position if you choose the white warg because you got to dismount pretty much immediately. Yeah. Um, so much better to make the... Uh, white warg um the because i think you can make the i'm not sure if it's addressed in here but you can also make the white warg the the guy that gets protected in fog of war which is probably a much better use for white warg shenanigans but well if azok dismounts and throws the white warg at the target does that work on a three mm, plus i don't know that's a, that's a question for another faq mm. maybe yeah. it'll be in the new rule book yeah all right so if a bat swarm is under the effects of channeled version of Shroud of Shadow's magical power and is engaged in a fight, do the models they're engaged with have their fight value twice? Once for the blinding swarm and once for the magical power, or just once? They will only have their fighting value once rounded down. So, for everybody who's reading this, never cast channeled Shroud of Shadows on a bat swarm. Um, what happens if the Goblin, goblin Scribe is affected by a heroic march? The Goblin Scribe will be unaffected by the Heroic March. This means he will not increase his move value by three inches, but also does not have to remain within six inches of the hero that declared the Heroic March if they call at the double as he cannot move. That's probably well, my hopes of, uh, of the Goblin Scribe growing legs have been dashed. <laughs> I mean, it, it really means nothing because he's carried. So the people carrying him do get affected and then therefore he moves three inches faster. So it's like, yeah, kind of on, like I don't, I don't. I mean, I I understand why this needed clarification, but yeah, because I guess the answer otherwise without this clarification is you called heroic march and the goblin scribe could suddenly move three inches on his own by like dragging right. himself along the ground somehow or just swinging really fast in one direction. So it, like I, I don't know, <laughs> just I can imagine <laughs> him swinging and just like inching over forward. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, and then we go just real the quick. Um, we we yeah. kind of went over it quickly, but we also assume that the um the bat swarm question means that. If you were to say have like a spider under Shroud of Shadows and a bat swarm in a combat, that they would not double the effect, right? It's not just the bat swarm itself. Yeah, I think that is a logical yeah, implication. Right, of that's that a one. logical interpretation because yeah. this has come up for me before. So basically, this, this is another FAQ. Legion, so this is an FAQ that like kind of half answers the question. Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. I mean, you would never really do it to the bat swarm. The the question is really. 
if you throw a bat swarm on a character and then a shroud of shadow spider on that character do you double have the fight because it's two models with the effect i assume that everyone will agree that this means that you only do it once no matter who is actually shrouded but i assume someone will disagree with that somewhere but they'll be wrong i've been playing a lot of assault on lothlorien because everyone in the world plays it now and this comes up more often than you'd think yeah so fair enough yeah um okay uh so we're moving on to the armies of the lords of the rings and the first one can well actually we'll go down i think we'll we missed one at the top there but did we nope. no we didn't nope you're right all right all right, so we're going to go in column order here. So can Shadow Facts be chosen as a hero to protect target in scenarios where this is applicable, such as assassination or fog of war? And the answer is no. Shadow Facts does not have the hero keyword, even though he has a fake characteristic, which is exclusive to heroes. Yeah, so that's interesting. So you'd be like the first character that actually has, I mean, sorry, first like non-hero model with might, will, fate. Yep. That, which, by the way, the rule book says can't exist. So, that opens up well we haven't seen the rule book there's a new one who knows <laughs> fair enough yeah okay well i wonder if that could be more significant than just simply this like what if like so let's say they make the new rules one day like say like um heroes are the only ones who can call heroic actions right but might can be used just generically to do xyz what it does now might will fake so now you could see like trolls get a point of money can't call a heroic action with it, but you know, or not a troll, but you you get what I'm saying. Like anything, any any uh, kind of like model could now be eligible to get might will fate since this shows here it's not special to just heroes. It's not unique to that. It could be that, or in the alternative, it could be that they forgot to put the hero keyword on shadow facts, and now they are just covering it up. That is probably very correct, but I'm hoping that they use this as a reason to maybe <laughs> allocate more might around the game. <laughs> well, hold on. I'm going to get my book for this. <laughs> right. Let's take a look at Shadow Fax's profile because <laughs> this could this could get trickier than that. Oh, so oh, wait, it's Gandalf trickier. the White, Shadow Fax. So Shadow Fax technically does not have time any on keywords this question at all. Than I thought we would. So Gandalf Evan, has this keywords, but Shadow is the most is important not. question we're answering today. So you already <laughs> you already put me to sleep um, with talking about the the licensing of GW. So uh, <laughs> I've gotten a couple of nice naps in. <laughs> hmm. These are there's, these there's are more important to this story. questions. This is the unexpected podcast. We ask the questions. <laughs> That the listeners want to hear you know yeah that's right I, I guess i guess i'm just not old enough to understand the intricate complexities that are associated with these matters <laughs> exactly exactly that um, you know what one day just like Devin, you will hit puberty and these things will will make sense to you it, so. where, where does the fell beast <laughs> profile show up somebody remind me of that uh in It'd be the in more Baradur, i think section mm-hmm. you know Baradur 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 comes Baradur. before Mordor. i don't know it's wherever it would be first. So I think I'm Baradur pretty sure it's probably I, I will say this. Evan's probably right, but I'm sure no one else actually it's, cares about it's this. It's on page 140. Look, if we could spend 10 minutes talking about a bear, we can spend 10 minutes figuring out this useless information. <laughs> you see, the difference is that, Rob, you weren't there when we were talking about the bear. And yeah, now because you're, here, you're you guys and, put and my you just entire make household everything to sleep. so much more boring. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what's interesting about the Shadow Facts profile is it has no keywords at all, mm-hmm. as opposed to the Fell Beast uh, profile that has the monster and cavalry keywords. So apparently Shadow Facts is not even cavalry. No, um, he just, he's nothing. Yeah, yeah, he's a nothing. All right, well, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I'm now you heard going it here to agree first, guys. Horses time. are not people, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Can Grimbold upgrade any warriors from Ro- the Rohan army? list to be hell hell helm and gas helm and gas helm and gas or just the warrior of rohan profile and the answer is just the warrior of rohan profile do we need to talk Why about that more? question yeah. that's an interesting question like i didn't that i'm surprised i needed clarification yeah. same here well can a wood elf sentinels eldamar met oh we've already read that one mm-hmm. um you can't have somebody go into charge somebody without a control song um uh <laughs> Gulavar, uh, so this is one that's actually a change in practice here, or at least a change in practice from everybody I've talked to about it. Gulavar's strength of body, strength of will, special rule states that his attacks and courage are equal to his remaining wounds. 
How does this interact with special rules that increase or decrease a model's courage value, such as Harbinger of Evil or a Warhorn, or magical powers that permanently affect a model's courage value, such as Drain Courage? Gulivar can still be affected by special rules that increase or decrease his courage value as normal. In these instances, work out that Gulivar's courage values would be equal to his remaining wounds, and then apply a modified and special rule in question. So if Gulivar had his full four wounds remaining and was affected by the Harbinger of Evil special rule, his courage value would be three. Gulivar cannot be affected by magical powers that permanently affect his courage values, such as drain courage. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't know how you guys have played it. We have always played it that because of the wording, it is always equal to his... Uh, I always ruled it where you can't he can't be affected basically. Right. Yeah. So th so this is a change to practice. So um Gulivar, I think when he, you know, Angmar and Angmar actions, Gulivar and whenever there's a fell or a uh ring wraith around, it's gonna be a lot harder to get um Gulivar in. And but on the other hand, if you really want to get him in, buy that warhorn because apparently he's affected by it. Mm. Where but it would be very difficult to get a warhorn in your list with you him. You could always um, ally in uh, Bolg and then a hunter orc with warhorn as an impossible alliance. You could do it that way. Yeah. <laughs> that would Seems be good. Yeah, yeah. right. Like, that's pretty excessive too. Yeah, that's right. I forgot orcs don't get warhorns. Yep. Yeah, I. I mean. I think the good change, though, that they made is that he can't permanently be affected by Drain Courage. So I think that's good because otherwise you could make him useless really fast if you have a ring right now. There. Now, that's interesting because I had I had also always understood that he could never be affected by Drain Courage. Yeah. Um, but see, I think that second part is actually a change they made specifically not to neuter him to death with like drain courage right because I mean, then his drain of courage just disappears i mean at least he can resist that but still yeah um basically gulivar is a ridiculous model with way too many rules and just change it completely yeah <laughs> all right can a dead marsh specter as a fell light is in the special rule be used to make an this enemy is model the same thing same yeah, question. charge mm -hmm. if they were charged if the unit they're charging is not out of the control zone the answer is no it's just like the the sentinels so all right. If a, uh, and all right, so we're going to ignore the bat swarm again. All right. If a model within six inches of Grima Worm Tongue declares a heroic action without spending might, such as through the Master of Battle rule or special rule in their profile, how many might do they have to spend due to Grima's Worm Tongue special rule? Um, uh, none, as no might points are being spent to declare the heroic action. I feel so, like we've seen something like this before. Yeah, I think so. Um, this didn't come as a surprise to me. Okay, so here is another significant change um, to continue with... More so than the bear? Because, I mean, that, that was a big change. Yeah, more so than the bear, and that is the Shades Chill Aura change from passive to active. So that, um, that's actually a fantastic change, in my opinion. I think... I think... Um, the fact that you could never stop the negation because i mean the, the problem with angmar angmar uh, plays its strategy is to make your opponent not play and i think you really need some counterplay to make angmar more fun and this is just helping that along that counterplay to the mom now will it ever really happen no everyone protects the, the hell out of their shades so i mean you know good luck getting to them but yeah the only issue here is as has been pointed out online that the faq uh, still exists saying, can a shade use a chill or a special rule if it is transfixed or paralyzed? And the answer is yes, as is it a passive ability, even though it needs to be activated at the start of the fight phase. Oh, uh, yeah, they forgot to delete that. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I would assume that the errata takes precedent over the, the new errata takes precedent over the old FAQ, but you know, I'm just pointing that out for people who want to be annoying rules lawyers. Um, and then we have the other kind of significant change from the FAQ, which is page 179, Isengard Assault Ballista, piercing shot at the following sentence, and Isengard Assault Ballista has a range of six inches to 48 inches. So Assault Ballistas now have a six inch minimum range, which, um, okay. There's, that, there's a reason why siege engines have never had six inch minimum ranges before, and that's because they affect almost nothing. Um, especially yeah. when you're going to have multiple of these um, chilling at the back of the board, like 
if you get within six inches of one of them, you're probably just going to get shot by the other one. By the other one, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I, th- yeah, I, mean, I think what this really just says to me is it can't shoot into its own combat anymore. Yeah, that's it, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah, I, I mean, so the other thing that the other thing that's good about this is it makes it significantly more of a problem for the assault on Helm's Deep list to deal with maelstrom of battle because you got to plop those siege engines down within six inches by the edge of the board before deployment and it allows the other player to spend whatever might he needs to get somebody to come on within six inches of these things um and not be shot at or at least not be shot at by one of them because obviously what you want to do if you're smart is you you start your two uh siege engines like a foot at least a foot apart from each other um, so that uh, one can cover the other one with fire, but um, you know it's still now um, still better than having no minimum range. There, please remind me because there is at this point a million pages of FAQs. But uh, the siege engine itself cannot be flung by getting hit by another siege engine, right? So, like if you shoot a ballista at another ballista, you don't fling the actual ballista away. I mean, I know they can't be knocked down doesn't... anymore, right? Uh, he says, reaching for the rule book. Uh, <laughs> I think it, it would have to, there would have the to be ballista, something. Well, there was an FSQ the that they can't be knocked a... over, right? You'd have to isn't have something the ballista, to say. It doesn't what's it happen. called? So. What's the it's, opposite of a battlefield target? It's like a. It, so siege it's a target? large siege engine. A siege so target. A siege target. Siege target, which means I think the the rules for flinging stuff back uh, uh only applies so, to battlefield targets so, and, and the reason by the way mm-hmm. is that um it has a strength it has a notional strength of nine so i don't think it gets flung <clears throat> backwards mm-hmm. okay yeah i mean in any case like if you're in maelstrom and somebody is assaulting one ballista and you're shooting it with the other that's still yep. a win because it means that ballista is not shooting their other stuff right right like it's killing their yep. own crew members essentially so o- only I'll ta- things I'll, I'll take it right but it's, yep. it's doesn't it should be 12 um otherwise it doesn't meaningfully change much except that it can't just literally point black shoot into its own combats but um but yeah okay so i think that is all right so that's the end of uh armies of the lord of the rings um, all right, because this is a competitive podcast, we are going to gloss over battle companies. Uh, mm. For those of you who play battle companies, feel free to look those up. Fall the Necromancer. Over, I yeah, I don't either. <laughs> uh, and there are none to follow the Necromancer. It remains mm. unchanged. Um, Gondor at War also remains unchanged. And let's see, the match play guide. I think there was one in here, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, so in Heirlooms of Ages Past, if the relic is in possession of a model, which will which will score their controlling player six victory points, will the opposing player score three victory points if they have more models within three inches of the model carrying the relic than their opponent? The answer is no. The three victory points for having the most models near the relic only applies if no models are in possession of the relic at all. So there you go. You can feel the internalized pain um, from people that have tried to rule it that way because they've had like 50 models within three inches of the relic bearer and just not killed the relic bearer Mm -hmm. and lost the game because of it. Yep. I mean, FAQ should have said heirlooms of ages past, remove this from the book. Full stop. (laughs) Now that would be a great change. So the next uh, next is the rules. Um, there are a few in here. If a model has to make in the way rolls when making strikes against a model, such as the Condus char- Chariot or the Iron Hills Chariot, do they make an in the way rule roll for each strike individually or a single roll and apply that to each strike? They make an in the way roll for each strike individually, which I think we all knew, but apparently somebody didn't because they asked and their question has been answered. Mm-hmm. Um, if a model elects to resolve their strikes one at a time and kills all of their targets before resolving all of their strikes, are the remaining strikes still resolved? No, as there's just, nothing left for them to kill. Like, how does this ever come up? Like, could, maybe I'm too dumb to understand a situation where this is. Relevant. Did they think you? Did they think you would strike the the other models in the combat that you were fighting with, like? Were you going to strike the spear support? I don't understand what's so going on. So the only way I can think this would have come up is for models that get something back for inflicting wounds. 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say, like healing. Mm. Yeah. Like, that, like that's the only right? situation I can think of, too. Yeah, yeah, but even then, they they would get them back by killing something, which means a strike would have to be successful. But if there's no target, it can't possibly be successful. Well, I guess yeah. what they... Guess this probably if, happens if, like, when they roll a pocket of dice, and then, you know... But it specifically says, elects to resolve their strikes one at a time, right? Yeah. So... So what they're saying is, if you want to get all your wounds back with Gulivar, specifically elect not to do all your strikes one at a time, which, forgive me if I'm wrong, but don't the rules say you have to theoretically always do them one at a time and the fast they, rolling is They just should take for place convenience? one at a time, as far as I'm aware. Like, yeah. I mean, I we, we roll them all at once just to speed things up, but I think it's always understood you do, it's happening one at a time. Well, I think in the rules specifically, you always do things one at a time. It's just, yeah. you know, obviously for gameplay, right? You speed I, it up. But. I'm not sure that's true, by the way. I think if I'm, if I, and I don't have the rule book in front of me right and now, but I, I think if I, I remember correctly, there is something in the rule that says you have to choose between rolling them all at once and rolling them one at a time. Interesting. Uh, because I think it's specific to shooting. I don't, I don't think so because I think I think what it has to do is it has to do with like when people make fate checks. Right? I think shooting is actually the opposite. I think shooting you technically have to shoot one at a time. It's just that everybody yeah, I think shoots that's right. in groups because otherwise it would take five hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, so the the issue with resolving wounds in close combat is um, knowing when you can drop might on something as opposed to the other guy knowing when he needs to use fate. Because there is that kind of weird game within a game, right? So if 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 I'm if I'm making six attacks with this one hero because he's trapped or whatever, um, I in most cases I'm going to want to roll six dice all at once, um, because I want to know, you know, you know, do I do I want to do I want to increase this with uh, might and or this die with might? Mm -hmm. If you're doing it one at a time, you don't know whether you know the the four. You know, you need you need a six to wound, but then you roll the five. You know, might I get another six with some of the other ones? Whereas, you know, the alternative is if you roll them one at a time, then you can say, all right, I'm going to go with this model until it's dead, and then I'm going to go with the next model. Um, but anyway, yeah. So it says in the rule book, you may choose to fully resolve these strikes one at a time. Or altogether, if you wish, so long as both players know and understand exactly what is happening. And then under multiple attacks, um, it is allowed and often a good idea to see the result of one strike before rolling for the next. So I guess theoretically you can choose not to do it, but I don't under, yeah, I mean, outside or of fast choose, rolling, right? If you can choose to a, do um, all at once, then basically if you gain a benefit, then just roll it all. And then this FAQ doesn't matter. Right. But, well, that's what I'm saying is like, that doesn't make any sense. Right. So yeah. it's like, if you want to, if you want to make sure to do something that is going to harm you, choose to play by the rules. Otherwise, choose well, to do it the other way so that you can claim the benefit. It almost like encourages bad play. Right. Well, no, no, there, there is a time under the rules where you want to do it one at a time. And there is a time at the, under the rules where you want to do it all at once. There's advantages in two different situations. So let's say that I am um, I'm fighting a hero who is defense six and mm -hmm. I am or defense seven and I'm fighting in the same combat a spearman or whatever who's defense four. I need a lower number to kill the spearman who is defense four, but I need a different number to kill the hero who is defense seven. But it's going to take a lot of damage to kill the hero that's defense seven, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I have a choice here. If I want to focus on killing the hero and then deprioritize uh, the, the Spearman, what I may choose to do is say, I'm going to roll all of my attacks against the hero because I want to know exactly how much might I need to spend to kill the guy. And the only way I can do that is to put all the dice on the table at once, see what I roll, and then allocate might accordingly. And that means that Spearman's going to get off scot-free because I'm rolling at the guy that uh, I'm rolling at the hero and I'm rolling at the hero only in the alternative. What I can choose to do if what I want to do is like maximize the number of wounds that I do is I go with the hero or I go with the, the spearman who needs put four, you know, fours or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I go one at a time and I go one. Did I kill him? Yes. No. All right. I didn't kill him. So I'm going to go another one. Okay. Now I killed him. 
So now I've got X number of strikes left over, and now I'm going to take all of those and go with the heroes and the hero and use might accord me. But that's the way I need to to divvy it up. I mean, that makes total sense though, right? But like that, this this FAQ doesn't really cover that because, unless you're trying to claim that, let's say miraculously, you kill the spearman and you kill through the hero. Yeah, no, and you just have, I mean, you know, might not, or, um, attacks none of that over, make, right? None of that makes this FAQ any more necessary yeah. because it ought to be obvious to everybody that once you've killed everybody, <laughs> you can't get any more benefits for killing anybody. Right. Um, and so if the only benefit is theoretically like you can get back wounds or something like Gulivar for killing stuff and yeah. you choose to fast roll it under the idea that you're going to somehow use this FAQ to say, well, because I rolled them all at once, they all get me wounds back, even though I killed you with the first three attacks and the other no. ones are wasted. The, like the that, only, that just seems, yeah. Yeah, the only point I, I'm making is is that- No, you're completely right. Roll, you know, rolling all saying, the dice yeah. at once and rolling them one at a time are not equivalent. There is a time to do one and there is a time to do the other. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, and folks should know that. Um, but in either case, this rule doesn't tell us anything we ought not to have known mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, all right, so uh, the next one. So special rules refer to checking to see if a model will be trapped if it loses a fight. When should this be checked and exactly what does it mean? This is actually a useful mm -hmm. FAQ. Mm -hmm. So the answer, this should be applied at the time the special rule in question comes into effect. For example, some may say at the start of the fight phase, in which case you would check to see if the model is trapped at the start of the fight phase. Others might say during the fight or similar, in which case you would check at the start of that fight before any dice are rolled. In all instances of this type of rule, bottle would be considered trapped if, should they lose the ensuing fight, they would be unable to back away as normal. If the model would not back away as a result of the friendly model deciding to make way, then that they would not be considered trapped for the purposes of this special rule. So I think two things come out of this, um, and I think both affect the interaction of this rule when um, you're charged by mounted. I think as I read this rule, um the if you charge somebody if you charge somebody on foot with a mounted model and if you win he would be knocked down um he still does not count as trapped for the purposes of the special rule and i think this so and i think the the, the one if it's in my head where this matters is um uh, who's the who's the new king of dale it's uh it's brand Brand King of, of Dale has a thing where if he would be trapped, and I think it's at the end of the fight phase. No, the, it's at the beginning. Check at the beginning okay. of the fight phase. And if at the end of the fight phase, he would be trapped, should he lose the fight, then he lose um, the fight. Right. So but since trap means inability to back away, if he loses to a mounted model, he does not get the benefit of this. Well, I think I actually see it the other way because um, he would be of course knocked, you knocked do, prone. Cause gonna... <laughs> well, because I play Dale. No, but um, in the rules for being knocked prone, it says you automatically count as trapped if you are knocked prone. Yeah, except this does not, this FAQ does not say that. This FAQ well, says the way to tell if you're trapped is if you can back away or not. And if you can back away, you are not trapped for well, purposes yeah, but of these rules. I'd imagine the main rule book. I think this is actually for Moria goblins, right? Because otherwise, this is for Moria. I was thinking. Yeah. I was yeah. thinking two things, Ingold and Moria Goblins. Yeah. Uh, Ingold had a fun rule where basically um, if you had um, a model uh, spear supporting uh, the model that was uh, affected by Ingold's special rule, he would, they would effectively be auto-trapped mm -hmm. um, because they were unable to make way. And when you check um, for trapping, um, then they would be considered trapped. And because they don't, uh, they don't actually back away, they are considered trapped. Mm -hmm. But now um, that they can make way, uh, or they can basically say, uh, if the model would be able to back away as a result of the friendly model deciding to make way, then they're not trapped. Basically means that mm -hmm. Ingold no longer automatically traps his models, and that's a similar thing for Moria goblins, where in some specific rulings of uh, the uh, Moria Goblins army bonus, uh, people would argue 
I get this army bonus literally every single time because uh, the spear supports are trapping the models in front of them, thus okay. giving me the... Or, or, or alternately, rules. you will never get this army bonus because you check for trap at the end of combat and right. you have to determine fight before, right? Either way, it didn't yes. work. So. All right, that that's all fair, um, yeah. and, and that's all useful. However, I still maintain the way this rule is written... Um, you do not get the whatever bonus you get for being trapped if you're a model you do not get if you're charged by cavalry because even if you are knocked down you could still back away and that is the litmus test for being trapped quote i'm making air quotes here for those who are who are not watching this on youtube or listening to some podcast those who are trapped within the meaning of this rule um the test is can you back away or not yeah, I, I'm going to go and say I think it means the opposite. So we need another FAQ. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I, I mean, I here's think, the thing. Like, I think for Brand, um, it specifically is you can't auto trap me if you just decide to choose not to back away, right? Like, it can't trigger that rule. Right. But because being knocked down by cavalry very specifically says you will be knocked prone and will automatically count as trapped, I think it would trigger his rule. This is actually yeah, one of the rare moments. Except for the language that says, in all instances of this type of rule, a model would be considered trapped if, should they lose the ensuing fight, they would be unable to back away as normal. Yeah, but then after they back away as normal, they then get knocked over, and the secondary rule says now they count as trapped. So it's really a loop. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah I mean, honestly, I think any events organizer is going to include cavalry the cavalry, sorry, <laughs> in, in this, I, I don't, I don't see anyone being like, I, it's clear that they just didn't think about that when they wrote it. I, <laughs> yeah. All right. Fair enough. I mean, I'm not arguing that that's also only the, that the singular model that has a rule that would be affected by this. Right. I don't think anybody else does what brand does. I, yeah. I'm trying to remember if there's anybody else who gets a benefit for being trapped that I'm not, I'm not certain. Oh, there's there that, a... there's that new garbage, um, Erebor Dale legendary legion where they get free heroic combats if they're trapped. Oh Yeah. Uh, yeah. that, and to be fair, There's similar things for other models. I think we're well. going to see that rule more often anyway. I think you can see GW is exploring other types of rules uh, that we've never seen before. And I think, you know, like with the Dale, uh, now a reverse charge mechanic and, and, the, and then the whole trap thing, they're starting to explore that. So I think we're going to see mechanics around trapping a lot more so it's probably good that they're inserting this before they get too far ahead of themselves yeah i, I by, actually by think the they way, just need another faq for how this interacts with cavalry honestly yeah i i think you're probably right there because i i can see somebody arguing you know like if they're fighting that that dale erebor legion that that was not intended to mean that the heroes automatically get free heroic combats whenever they're charged by cavalry mm -hmm. yeah um yeah. which is you know what it means <laughs> so so uh, let us let us ask for another clarification in six months. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Until then. Until then, let us argue the at events. Feet. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Ad infinitum. Uh, okay. Uh, question. Can a model affected by the immobilized transfixed magical power interact with anything else during the turn in which they are affected, such as detonating a demolition charge, interacting with objectives and scenarios that will allow this using a special rule from a legendary legion that requires them to act? Sh uh, shout or similar such as death from the riders of Thane and legendary legion or any other similar situation answer is no the degree of common sense is required when working out what a model affected by the immobilized transfixed magical power can do the model would theoretically need to move to do it then they are unable to do so so i do actually agree with some people on facebook that i've seen that they should never say common sense that correct <laughs> yeah that that is not it i think that that's i have to even with what they said about it it just really is a coverall for essentially wording errors in your, your rules writing but <clears throat> i mean yeah <laughs> other than that that would be the only problem i'd have with it because i'm like once you say common sense it's like well shit like <laughs> there's going to be so many situations it's, common sense speaking it's a license to argue yes yeah um, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh you know it it it, it it's funny uh, you know we we got to remember we're playing at like a fantasy game with miniatures and you know a, a good friend of mine a long time ago before this game existed was playing some sort of fantasy miniature game and um you know as as all all players do on occasion was arguing the rules and found himself um uh stating the case of elves flying on lizards would never do that <laughs> yeah 
and he said as soon as he made that statement, he realized he was playing the wrong type of game for his personality. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I think this is this is the the classic example of that. Is that I'm not sure that the common sense that you and I both have, Devin, really applies mm-hmm. in the world of <laughs> Florida the Rakes. <laughs> uh, you know All that right. one time I was immobilized. I definitely couldn't do X, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh all right so the next one can a model that is already affected by the set ablaze special rule be affected by it again whilst they are still set ablaze can you be set ablaze if already set ablaze uh the answer is no um you could only be on fire once so you know what you read some of these questions and then you immediately think Devin, you're right. Common sense among this community <laughs> should never be a metric. Somebody asked this question. Some of these are like, this shouldn't be a question for anyone with common sense, right? <laughs> That's right. Which just goes to show you that common sense is subjective. Wow. God, let's go back to elves on flying lizards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Goodness gracious. <laughs> Who would never, ever do that. Uh, uh, thank you, Jeff McCarg, if for some reason you are ever listening to this. Um, I have taken that example to heart and continuing to use it 20 years later uh does a model with a swift movement special rule still measure the vertical distance when moving over obstacles the answer is yes which i think we've been doing except for yeah, i think places. everyone's been playing it like that well common uh, yeah. sense would dictate yeah. well i think i think i think everyone with the potential exception of one player that we know who plays spiders a lot um who will only do it if you tell unless you tell him to <laughs> yeah uh, let's see um when a siege engine fires, uses, and severs he- severed heads, does the shot still scatter as normal, resulting in the model uh, the shot scatters into being the initial target for purposes of the severed heads? And the answer is yes. I'm not quite That's sure another one I'm where I'm really surprised. That's yeah, that I'm not sure that was ever in doubt. But um, that one. Uh, okay, read. we've read, we've gone through the heirlooms one before. Will of Evil. This is a mm. change. This is errata. Mm. Um, replace the last sentence of the first rules paragraph with the following a model with this special rule may not use their last point of will to cast magical power and cause themselves to be removed as a casualty. Thank God. Mm. Um, I sure do love playing five minute games. Yep. Yeah, right. actually, no, <laughs> this would have saved me so much trouble. There's a Nova year two, I think. Uh, one of our players ended up. Like it was all Nazgul versus another player in domination. The other player decided to castle in a corner because this is back when, you know, Nazgul and Felbees were absurd. Mm -hmm. And so the other player was like, okay. And then just like jumped on one objective, popped all his race, and it was 25% ending condition. So that was it. And And it it was like almost caused a fist fight. It actually almost caused a fist fight. (laughs) Which, uh, yeah, which you know, the new Ring Wraith Legendary Legion can still do on occasion. So yeah, this is this is a good thing. So, I mean, that's a good thing. Um, and, it, and it hits the um, the correct thing, which is the Legendary Legion. But theoretically, they can still pop themselves with their own abilities that cause a will. Yeah, and by so, charging into combat. Yeah, yeah. so there are yeah. ways for them to pop themselves, just not in the Legion where that's really the only place it's a problem right now. But yeah, exactly. Well, and, and- yeah, so I suppose the way to, if you want to get rid of yourself is you you cast a spell with all but one of your will and then then charge in combat, but not in the Legion, as you point out. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, let's see. I'm not sure we have anything else significant. Nothing there. Nope. Maybe until uh, you get into Defense of the North, I think. Yeah. Uh, and that's, and that's, that's right. like six pages of one model. Um, yeah, right. six pages of one model. Okay. Oh so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I was only cu- somewhat kidding. So all right. So let's clear. Let's clear out some of the underbrush before we get into the um, Dragon Emperor's FAQs. Uh, so Grim Bjorn transforms into a bear and pushes people around the same way that Bjorn does, um, and he can also do it when he's part of a heroic combat. Um, so then we get to the Dragon Emperor. Do special rules that affect both the rider and the mount, such mm-hmm. as the War Camels and Paler special rule, affect both the Dragon Emperor Run and the Royal Palaquin? And the answer is yes, although this doesn't make him a cavalry model, uh, uh, which is fine. Um, can magical powers that affect either the rider and mount, such as Black Dart or Wither, be used to target either the Dragon Emperor Run or the Royal Palaquin? The answer to this is yes, although it doesn't make him a cavalry model. Uh, that's when actually it, huge. That's a that's a great. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's a great change, but like, the, I, I've never bro, used throw six dragon. black darts at the palanquin. Huh? 
throw six black darts to the pelican? Well, I was really thinking about Blade Wrath, how you can give him like, you know, nine strength, mm. six attacks. Oh, that's that's still a thing. Targets the oh, whole yeah. model. We'll, we'll get that to goes that. on to the yeah. next question. When All magical right. power targets the whole model, oh, such sorry. as Blade <laughs> Wrath or Paralyze, will this affect both the Dragon Emperor of Run and the Royal Palaquin? And the answer is yes. So, um, yes. Which is interesting because he gets paralyzed but is not prone. Right. So how does that work? Like, I, I feel like there's another question in there. Like, the palanquin can't be knocked over, but is he, like, considered prone on his palanquin? Like, how does that work? Well, is no, he now the trapped? Whole, the whole thing is prone. But it can't be knocked prone under any well, circumstances. Right. So it can't be right? knocked, oh, no, okay, yeah, that's fair. No, he's, no, he is, he is not prone. So he is um, not trapped by paralyze, or? He is not trapped by paralyze, but he still is auto-losing the fights. It's... Um, yeah, Mick, Mick and I did a little, uh, I don't know, an email or a Facebook messenger exchange where, or maybe it was on Facebook where we were trying to figure out what this means. And uh, at the end of the day, we came out with, um, yeah, so the Dragon Emperor gets paralyzed. He auto loses fights. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't double strikes. But you don't double strikes because okay. he's not on the ground. And can he can back away while paralyzed right that doesn't prevent you from backing away uh, yeah i think you can back away well like paralyzed. you count as trapped but you can still yeah. back away if paralyzed yeah, i think so because you're still you're still prone and get get pushed back and mm -hmm. and what it means is you can kind of line up a whole bunch of guys around the perimeter of the uh palanquin and everybody can try and wake him up mm -hmm. yeah and so so he's not prone but he still counts as being unable to move for the purpose of turning off active special rules. If he has any, I don't know if, which ones of his are active or passive. Yeah, I don't, right? I, you know, I don't think now I'm trying to remember if the, um, I think the, the flags are passive. Yeah, I think so too. Well, uh, Boromir's flag is passive. So I imagine his is too. Yeah. And it's, it's since he's not prone, it's still up. So, yeah. he's still, you know, his banner is still there. Right. I mean, Boromir would be turned off by the fact that yeah, he would so be knocked over. But yeah, paralyzed basically does nothing to him, essentially. Well, other I mean, than making lose fights. Yeah, he, he loses fights and he can't <clears throat> make any strikes and he can't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's still. So it's thing. just the glorified well, immobilize basically on him. Well, it's a permanent immobilize until like until he can get it fixed. Um, and, and <laughs> you know, and he auto loses fights. He's not he's not, you know, fighting at six with three attacks to well and it's a good thing that his little bearers don't count as models for the purpose of rolling dice for unparalyzing him too yeah so this also answers yeah. the this also answers a question that i've asked a while back which is you know if he gets transfixed can his um can his palaquin make strikes if he wins and i think probably the answer to this is no <clears throat> um i'll take it uh if the royal palaquin is affected by a magical power that permanently reduces a characteristic like wither or drain courage and then the dragon emperor of run subsequently dismounts are the black dragons replaced that replace the royal palaquin also affected by the magical power the answer is yes in addition if the ma royal palaquin is affected by the wither magical power it will also reduce the strength of the strikes that the royal palaquin makes if the dragon emperor of run wins the fight that's a hell of a whip to drag six men a palaquin and a guy on top well, that's the <laughs> next question yeah, if the Balrog, uh, yeah, okay. So if the Balrog or Watcher in the Water hits the Dragon Emperor of Run and his royal palaquin with their fiery lash or tentacles, special rule respectively, is the whole model dragged into combat or just the part that was hit? Both rules say the model, so it will be the whole model. Because mm -hmm. as we all know, we have to use a modicum of common sense. And obviously, that's what would happen if the, wh the whip wrapped around the Dragon Emperor, is it would pull. Not only mm -hmm. him, but the chair he was riding on the six guys care. <laughs> well, and it, it gets even worse. I have a I have a um a friend who is a huge Mumak enthusiast, and he's like, Well, why does my driver Mumak get pulled off independently while this jerk like takes his whole chair with him? <laughs> like, what the hell? Well, it's you just... know what it is? It's it's the well-trained bears who as soon as he gets snatched <laughs> off, they're yeah. like, quick, get under him again. And they, you know, they, they start to run yeah. and jump over. This is like he kind of figured like his pointy old... shoes like hook into loops and so yeah. it like pulls it with him. <laughs> yeah. This is like the old warg marauder model where basically <laughs> all three of the goblins were like nailed to the warg so they could not be <laughs> knocked off the warg for like any uh -huh. reason this is the same thing yeah and if the warg ever like rolled over those poor goblins had to go with it right 
So, yeah. but yeah, I mean that I, I get it. Like functionally, the Mumak is a moving piece of terrain, and everyone on top of it can theoretically move independently, and so they're affected independently. But like, yeah, I get it, right? Like, that's unfair. Uh, yeah. So, well, yeah. Interesting question. What happens if you hit the um, the howdah with a whip or tentacles? I don't know if you can target the howdah specifically. Yeah, you can. You, you, can. you can target. It has wounds and and such well so yep. then you pull the howdah off of the elephant <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and it takes all its guys with it who will now be an independent what? howdah <laughs> and using the rules of common sense they'll then dismount and pick up the howdah and carry it like a dragon emperor god i gotta see that happen at some point where a where a balrog whips the howdah off of a mac <laughs> you know what they it's should all just... common sense <laughs> all right um so how many models does the Dragon Emperor of Rune count as when determining the Force's breakpoint? Dragon Emperor of Rune is Royal Palaquin count as a single model when determining the Force's breakpoint. I think it says that in the rule itself. Uh, only the Dragon Emperor needs to be slain for the model to count as a casualty toward the Force being broken. That's, going, that's a change. Um, that is a huge change. Uh, additionally, any black dragons that replace the Royal Palaquin, such as when the Dragon Emperor dismounts or is slain, will not increase the Force's breakpoint. I think it says that, too, in the rule. However, each one that is subsequently slain will count as a separate casualty toward the Force being broken, um, which I think is the way it you know, kind of works right. as default. That's consistent with like the um, Goblin Scribe and stuff. Yeah, it's right? the Goblin yeah. Scribe type thing, where, where yeah. like new magical appearing figures don't increase your breakpoint, but can count against it if they get killed. Um, the interesting question, though, is I think, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, the 25% calculation works differently, and that actually is the number of models on the board rather than how many started the army. So you can get yourself further away from 25% by, um, just by dumping these additional, yeah, by dismounting. Interesting. Uh, I thought I thought that both points were set before the game. I might be wrong on that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't yeah. believe that is true. Interesting. Uh, but I don't have a rule book in front of me, so. Um, too tired to get up and get it again i yeah, burned myself right. on shadow facts i can't i can't be bothered um so does does raj goose's bone breaker remove all special rules associated with an enemy model's elven made weapon or does it just negate the bonus for winning the roll off in case of a tied fight mm. bone breaker only removes the bonus for winning the roll off in case of a tied fight any other special rules associated with the elven made weapon will still apply what on earth would those be other than like wounding the goblin king uh, I think like Hadafang has Spirit Bane or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah but that's, like that. that's that's not an. El I mean, that's that's not something you get by nature of being an Elven made weapon. Right, but I think that's what people were asking about. That's what they're yeah. arguing okay. here. Right. All right. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> again, common sense. It's ridiculous, right? But that's what I think <laughs> people were arguing. Yep. Uh, so, in the Defenders of the Erebor Legendary Legion, do friendly models need to be within three inches of all listed characters to benefit from the Royal Bloodline special <sighs> rule, or just within three inches of any of them? <laughs> A, within three inches of any of them. And remember, you just... don't... Yeah. All right, go ahead. Yeah, which is not what it says in the book. Uh, <laughs> it says all of them in the book. <laughs> but yeah, this, is a, this is a clear matter of the clear intent versus poor writing, yeah. right? <laughs> Fair enough. Do orc captains, orc warriors, and warg riders retain the hatred elf special rule granted by R Rasgush's war leader of the Norse special rule even after he is slain? The answer is yes. They do not mm. stop hating elves once um, Rasgush is killed. That does not make them love elves more. Wait, so his special rule is this? This is not a legion, right? Like this is just you plop the guy in your army, and that that bonus is just permanent. Yeah. Yes. And it's like, so I guess it's treated like an upgrade to the model that's free. Yep. Yep. Okay. If the assault on Lothlorien Legendary Legion is playing in the Clash by Moonlight scenario, will the scenario's Dark of Night special rule stack with the Legendary Legion's cover of, cover of Darkness special rule to give models a plus two to wound when making Moving back attacks? to common sense over the here. The answer is <laughs> no. The bonus is only applied once. And now I'm waiting for somebody to try and argue that um, because they didn't mention the reduction of uh, visibility that actually if you mm -hmm. stack the two of those, it reduces visibility to zero. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, okay. Yikes. I the answer to that one. Yikes. I think that's, oh, okay, wait, we've got some oh. errata too. Uh, oh, yeah, so these are the ones uh, that I think, I think most of these were ones that people had pointed out online. So mm -hmm. like Garrison of Dale can now have the Windlands in it. Um, 
Orifin gets the woodland creature special rule. Uh, he saved. Yes. Um, Bjornings uh, get a hand and a half axe and axe. He used to have a dagger, which made no sense. I see. Okay. So now if you if you take them with the uh, great bow, they can piercing strike. Right. Gotcha. Uh, Kamul, the Easterling, is now mm-hmm. back into the Easterling list. Um, he was kind of feeling a bit of an outcast for a while. Uh, and um, uh, Bjornings get a, a new edit here so that Bjorn can benefit from Grim Bjorn's heroic actions um, when he's in bear form. So, Which I think only applies outside of the Legion because the Legion already had that rule, right? So this is if yeah, you're somehow think playing right. side by side outside yeah. of the Legion for whatever crazy effing reason. But who knows? <laughs> uh, okay. So I think, did we do them all? Yeah. That's, did them everything. All. that's everything. Uh, so can we get started on the battle companies now? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That'll be a different episode. Um, all right, folks. Um, so yeah, so we're not going to do an army list this time because we had a lot to talk about. Um, I guess the other thing just to mention is that three out of the four of us, um, the, the cool kids here, basically everybody but Devin, is uh, heading off tomorrow. Uh, well, I think Rob's leaving a little bit later, but mm-hmm. we're heading off this week to Articon for um, SBG Fest. So uh, mm-hmm. hopefully we'll see folks over there and, and see listeners over there and mm-hmm. uh Hopefully this will uh, come out soon. I think we're going to try and do a live episode from Articon at some point. We'll see if we can make the technology work. Um, it would be kind of odd if um, you know we could manage to make this work when we're all in different continents, but couldn't figure out how to make it work when we're all in the same room. <laughs> but knowing the way technology works, that could actually be a problem. So uh, we'll Common see how sense. that goes. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, if anybody's going to Articon, come say hi. We'll have shirts. It'll be awesome. Yep. Take care, everybody.